Welcome to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. There are no traffic jams along the extra mile when you're studying for your bar exam. And now your hosts, Jackson Mummy and Megan Saya from Celebration Bar Review. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 327 of the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. This is Jackson. Glad to be with you. Hope everyone is doing well and surviving this very weird bar exam season that we're still in. In fact, we decided to title this episode The Upside Down. If you're a fan of the the TV show Stranger Things, you already know what that means. But it feels like everything is, in some ways, just upside down right now. We still have exams coming up at the end of September, and then we've got the big Plan B on October 5th and 6th. And then we have the Florida exam scheduled for October 13th. So there's a lot happening, and we're going to break it all down for you today in this episode of the podcast. My co-host, Megan, is going to join me in a minute, and we'll bring you up to date on what's going on. We'll also talk a lot about the study strategies for these upcoming sets of exams, and we're going to look ahead into 2021 and give you an idea about what we think uh, may be coming and how to be preparing now for that uh, set of exams and eventualities. If this is your first time on the podcast, we are glad to have you here. Thanks for joining us. We are now available in this podcast on Amazon uh, Podcast, which is cool, so you can find us there. All of our episodes, going back to episode number one, are archived on that site. And of course, the podcasts are also available. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Radio.com, Spotify, lots of other places. But glad to be on Amazon now. That's an exciting new uh, platform for us. And then the podcast is also available in video form. You can go to celebrationbarreview.com slash 327, that's the episode number, and watch the podcast there. So however you get your podcasts, we got you covered, I think. Now, I do want to let you know, before we get into our recap of the week and looking ahead into the next few weeks, that we've been offering a free special training webinar. It's called Now is the Best Time to Take Your Bar Exam why you should ignore the crowds and the fear. We've had thousands of people attend this webinar, and we'd love to have you join us as well. We're offering the webinar on a once a week basis. It's an hour long, completely free. And for the last uh, 10 minutes of each of these sessions, I do a live Q&A to answer any questions or update you on what's been going on. Now, the thesis of this webinar is to explain a particular strategy that we are finding very effective in preparing for the bar exam in this pandemic world. We're gonna walk you through step-by-step step what you need to be doing and why you can work differently than the crowd and the fear in order to be successful on your bar exam. I hope you'll join us for that. If you're watching today's podcast, uh, you'll see that there's a button right here at the bottom of the screen. Just click on that and you can register. And if you are listening to the podcast, there's a link in your show notes, or you can go to celebrationbarreview.com slash now for all the details, sign up, and then we'll see you on Saturday evening, 5 p.m. Eastern, that's two o'clock Pacific time for this special free training webinar. I hope you won't miss out on it, particularly if you're taking the exam in February of 2021. This is really important information for you. So look forward to seeing you on Saturday for now is the best time to take your bar exam. All right, I don't want to keep you waiting any longer. So let's go ahead and jump into this week's discussion about all the things that have been happening in the upside down world of the bar exam. We're obviously growing closer now on both the September 30th exam, very small number of takers for that exam, very few jurisdictions. And then the October 5th and 6th plan B, which is the big one, California, New York, a lot of other states. Uh, So we're within about 15 days or so, I think, on that exam. And then, of course, we've got Florida's, what do we call Florida's, Plan D, because it's the fourth try? (laughs) Yeah, really. (laughs) Plan D in Florida on October 13th. And then, mercifully, the 2020 bar exam season is finished, I think. Oh, my gosh. It could be. There's a possibility, I guess, that it could be, but you don't even want to think about that. No, I can't even let my mind go there. I saw that look on your face and I knew Mm -hmm. that was not a place we wanted to go. I guess the place to start, Megan, is just a a sort of a a 30,000 foot view. What's happening 
with bar exams as we make this final stretch run now into the last set of tests? Yeah, so Florida had their second sort of dry run today for the online software. The good news is I haven't heard any horror stories as of yet. So this is the no news is good news. Really, the only things I'm hearing are like, yeah, it seems to be fine. So that's really good. Florida did send out, so they, I think you'll remember, they have this registrant advocate now position that, that the Florida Bar provided. And so the registrant advocate sent out an email yesterday, I believe time is really running together. One of the, um, definitely a lot of helpful information in that. So if you were, if you're a Florida applicant and you uh, didn't see that in your email, you need to check your spam, make sure that you're getting these emails. They're really important. But the one thing I did want to say for our purposes on the webinar is that they did note that probably today, tomorrow, uh, you should be hearing about a backup plan for Florida. So I know we initially said Florida had said they would be coming up with a backup plan. Then we didn't hear anything about it for a while. And so maybe sort of assumed like, maybe, maybe no backup plan. But now they have confirmed that there will be one coming out imminently. I think this is important because Florida, of course, is a week behind the rest of the remaining exam, not remaining. We still have a, gosh, we still have the September 30th, but um, a week behind the October 5th and 6th exams. And so that does give them, they, it puts Florida in a really different position because uh, if the 5th and 6th goes poorly, Florida has time to make a change potentially. Whereas obviously these jurisdictions on the fifth and sixth, I mean, it, it's full steam ahead. You know, they're going to, if it, if it goes, if the ship goes down, it's going to go down on the fifth and sixth, not, you know, beforehand. So there's not going to be a lot of <laughs> warning time. So I think that's good news if you're in Florida that they are taking it seriously and looking to see which Jackson, I know we had talked about this initially when they picked these dates, we assumed they would pick a date after October 5th and 6th to allow for exactly this, for them to be able Able to readjust and make changes, you know. Yeah, if you're, if you're a California bar examiner, you're not sleeping well right now. <laughs> That's my view. That this has just got to be nerve wracking because there's so much discussion about the difficulties that ExamSoft is having with uh, just being able to reach them. You know, being able to get through on the helplines, being able to get responses to emails, uh, people not finding the passwords, not being able to, to load up their computers. And when you when you multiply that for the thousands of Cal bar takers and then the other several thousand, you know, New York bar takers and others, it feels like it's a really, really big group of you know, bar takers coming down at one time and ExamSoft still has not demonstrated what I would think of as a rock solid uh, platform to make this work. So, you know, the, the Florida bar examiners are looking kind of smart right now. I'm thinking the Cal bar examiners and the New York bar examiners are sweating it out. This, this just does not, you know, candidly, it just doesn't look good. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work or not. Yeah. The point is nobody knows if it's going to work. Right. Exactly. Exactly. If they knew it wouldn't work, then they would have they would have canceled their plan. No. Right. But that's not the case. And don't you love the national conference? We're washing our hands. We it's not oh, our problem. Yeah. You know, whatever you guys do, you know, we're 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 okay. Really? or something. Um, yeah. No, they sent out another, National Conference sent out another survey or will be sending out another survey to the next batch of in-person applicants asking questions like, do you think that you have more confidence in people who've passed the bar in person than an online exam? So yeah, um, the National Conference is just making it very clear that they, they don't like the online piece and they don't want anything to do with it. So... Yeah. yeah, and that and that really creates some interesting questions for 2021. If we ever get to 2021, which <laughs> is harder and harder every week, but I think 2021 is going to be a complete upside down world, right? To use the Stranger Things, uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it's we don't know if we're going to be online. We don't know. I know we're going to talk a little bit about some some questions about even when the February exam could be given in some states, and so when you've got that much uncertainty. I think one of the real dangers for bar takers, for, for those of you on the call today, is the temptation to be distracted by this and to lose sight of the fact that you've got to just study and not get too caught up in all the other noise and distraction of this because there's nothing you can do to control it. And, and so you just have to be ready. 
And because no one really can anticipate with great accuracy what that final version will look like, you can't be waiting around for it to come crystal clear before you decide to move into action. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. There's a good couple of good questions in the chat box about California. So I want to talk about these. First, Debbie said, I'm a retaker in California and have gone through the mock exams before. They were normally just press all of the buttons, but these are completely different. The first one I did had actual questions and an hour and a half timer. I was caught off guard and ran to a table to take it. Are we supposed to go through and answer these like a real test on exam soft? Well, I think it's an opportunity for you to, to take it as a practice test. We talked a couple of weeks ago about whether or not they would be using that for a baseline. They won't. Uh, they are supposed to be doing facial recognition, which is another interesting question. But I think that it's really just an opportunity for you to spend 90 minutes practicing an exam. And if you felt unprepared for it, okay, that's something to learn from. I would say before you do the mock exams, I would you know, get yourself in the right mindset using whatever tools and techniques that we've talked about and that have made available to you. And then I would go ahead and try and write the exam like you would normally, just so that you get that experience. I don't think anything will substitute for the feel of the software, the look on the screen, the use of the software itself. It's different than writing on your laptop casually in, in Microsoft mm -hmm. Word. And so I think you, you want to be doing that. If you ended up writing, what'd you say one time, Megan, Dr. Seuss, if you type Dr. Seuss yeah. uh, the mock exam, it'd be okay too, but I don't think it's, it's as valuable for you. Yeah. All right. And then Lorraine asked, did California use exam soft with video for the baby bar? How did that turn out? They, well, it was a little different. They did use exam soft, but they used uh, exam soft to proctor. And then it was just essays and it was, you know, shorter number of essays, and it was a much smaller group of much essays, smaller. right? Yeah. And so that that's what we don't know. I mean, in a small setting under a few hundred people, ExamSoft has been okay. Not perfect, as we saw in Michigan and some other states, but it's been okay. The problem is when you go from a few hundred to, you know, 10, 15,000 or more, <laughs> yeah. I think more, yeah, more, I, I think then you've got some real challenges. So everyone is using ExamSoft now. ILG has left the market apparently. And so it is, it is as you said, sink or swim with ExamSoft. And they should be using the same platform in every jurisdiction. I think that the rules for certainly the October 5th and 6th jurisdictions are identical because the 100 multiple choice questions are coming from a single source. Florida, Florida is using ExamSoft, but Florida is doing their own thing. So, you know, that's a little different. And certainly when we get to performance tests, California's performance test is different than the multi-state performance tests. Even though they're the same length of time, they're coming from different sources. So that could impact the way they show up on an ExamSoft screen. And I think part of what you and I've been reading, Megan, is that different jurisdictions are making different rules about highlighting and marking and working and scratch paper or not scratch paper. And so you've got to, as an applicant, you've got to be watching that in your jurisdiction and know what the rules are for you. Because just hearing about what we say about the rules in California or New York uh, or any other jurisdiction, Texas may not apply and probably doesn't apply to you in your jurisdiction. So you got to be careful about that. Great. And then one last question from the chat box. How will the 2021 February exam be impacted so far? And this person's in Florida. Well, all right, I'll talk about Florida and you can talk about California. How's that? <laughs> Isn't that nice of me? <laughs> in Florida, I think the biggest impact is that this bar advocate that uh, wrote to bar applicants the other day uh, made some indication that results from this October test, assuming it's given on October 13th, they would try to release results, I believe, in late November. I think that's what I'm remembering about that. And that then there would be a very short window of about three weeks for applicants who failed to declare their intention to take the February 2021 Florida exam. Now, that's a short window to be sure. I mean, if you get your results, and I, I can't see the results in Florida coming out any sooner than the end of November. So I'm thinking, you know, sort of like California in the old days, right? You've got your bar exam results on Thanksgiving, as I recall. Yeah, right. um, the, the, so you're, you're late in the, the season, and that basically gives you January and December 
December, January, <laughs> and then, you know, three weeks of February to get ready. So that's a short throw into to February. If the exam happens at the last Tuesday and Wednesday of February, but I, I'm going to continue to say there's every reason to believe that the exam will be not be able to be given on those dates unless they work out either how to give in-person exams and or how to do online exams effectively. Because remember, the national conference with the 200 question MBE is not going to an online exam yet. They, they have not said they're going to do that. So if you want to use the multi-state bar exam as of today in you know September of 2020, you would have to be in an in-person exam. And if you're in a state like Florida or California or New York or Texas, that's hard to do. So I, I think you keep studying as though there's going to be an exam, a full exam at the end of February, but don't be shocked and don't be, oh, oh, I never knew. No, you know, it's very possible that it will be something different in 2021. I, that's just, I think that's just the reality. So that's what I see in Florida. Uh, let me flip it back to you in California, because I know you've been watching those uh, yeah. movements pretty carefully. Yeah, so California results won't be released until January 29th. So, I, I mean, I know there are some of you, I know because we hear this, that think, well, that's okay. If I fail and I find out that I fail on January 29th, I can take the February exam. Please don't do that. If it takes place at the normal time, like you can't, I mean, that's, and there's also the question of if they would even let you, right? Registration would generally already be closed at that point. Yep. Uh, for the February exam. So we're not sure. But one thing that California's got a working group that's been meeting. They met last Friday. They're talking about a lot of different things. One of the things they're talking about is the possibility of pushing back the February exam. So, you know, that's all to say, how will February 2021 be affected? Like, we don't know. There's a lot of variables. The jurisdictions don't know either. I think they are probably feeling much the way that we all are. I know you guys are and we are right now, which is get us through October. Like we just, what did I think you said the other day, Jackson, you have October 15th is like, you've never been waiting for a day to come quicker in your life. Than the day. I clearly haven't. Uh, and I think one other thing to point out about California is if they say they're going to move back the February exam, it would be theoretically without the multi-state bar exam because right. the NCB is not going to put out one test in February I don't, I don't know how yeah, I mean, I will, I will tell you, right. This is just my own personal view, but I would highly doubt. So this time the, in 2020, the NCBE put out um, multi MBE questions for February, July, yeah. September, early September, late September, October 5th and 6th. I can pretty, I would bet almost anything on there is zero chance that they are going to write five MBE tests in 2021. They didn't want to do that. It was probably an incredible strain on their resources and manpower. That is writing MBE questions is not easy. It's very difficult. And, and on people who are already working from home and, you know, dealing with family members and children and all these things. So I, I just don't see that happening. So, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody, anybody who's telling you, oh, here's for sure what's happening in 2021. Don't listen to them because no one really knows. But yeah. And I, I, I think to, to your point about the NCBE, I think they've depleted their question banks. I mean, I just think they're out of questions now. And so they, they've got to scramble to come up with 400 questions for 2021 at a minimum. And when you start adding the possibility of more tests and test security, oh my God, you know, if they're not sleeping in California, I promise they're not sleeping in Wisconsin right now because this is just nightmarish for them as well. So yeah, it's, it's going to be wild. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let me just say really quickly also that that California working group is also discussing the possibility of applying the new pass score retroactively a couple of years. So just be aware if you fall into that range, if you, if that 390 would have given you a passing result in that sometime, I would say no more than three years before it might only be a couple, but just keep an eye out for that and know that there is a possibility that they're working on something. It could be provisional though. So that's less helpful, right? So yeah, I mean, um, what's provisional get you? You still would end up having to take the bar exam right. again. Yeah. I mean, it gives you the ability to work, as you pointed out to me before. But I don't understand the value of a provisional retroactive score. I mean, if you're going to be retroactive, be retroactive and just let people. Right. If you're not going to be retroactive, then don't and say here's the new scope, 
new score going forward. Again, I want to emphasize, because I do know people who are in that 1390 to 1440 range in the past who are fantasizing that somehow the nightmare is over. It is not. And until you hear from the Cal bar examiners and the California Supreme Court that they have made that decision, it has not been made. And this working group doesn't speak for either of those groups. Right. The and court has said, said no. that they would like the bar to apply it retroactively, but they are they need to come to a yeah. Well, and as we've talked about before, if you were looking up the word dysfunctional in uh, bar exams, you would see California in the definition. They are highly dysfunctional right now and continue to be, and they are racked by incredible internal politics. So, and in fact, I think it's still an acting director at the Cal Bar because the previous Cal Bar administrator, uh, president had to resign. So, <laughs> you know, I, I I hope it works out. I mean, it, gosh, it would help everybody's pass rate, wouldn't it? And it would help so many people get into the bar, which is the most important thing. But it still isn't happening. And please don't don't be distracted or, or misled and think you don't need to get ready for February 2021 20, in California. If you've taken the bar exam and you've scored 1390 to 1440, good luck. But well, and the good news is, you know, you can do it. So do so, it again, and then yeah, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, yeah. sign up for Celebration Bar Review, and we'll get you through. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How do I handle taking the online MBE during the October exam without scratch paper? I find I need to sketch things out, especially for property questions in Federal Civ Pro. Please help. Well, yeah, this is a really interesting question because it misses the entire point, at least of our methodology. We have, long, long before the online test, we were talking about and encouraging students to take multi-state bar exam questions and to, to answer them in 90 seconds a question or less. And so when I hear this particular question, you know, someone says, well, I want to sketch out and draw out and highlight and do all those things. Even if you could, even if we were in the world where you had a hard copy exam in front of you, I would say don't do that because at that point what you're doing is you're trying to outguess or out hustle the examiners and you're going to lose that most of the time. We have seen with literally tens of thousands of data points that the most effective answers on an MBE question come between about 85 seconds and 100 seconds. Once you get past 100 seconds on a question, your, your performance doesn't just gradually drop off, it drops off a cliff. So if you're taking that kind of time, if a question is so difficult for you that you feel like you need to graph it, I would just read it at a 30,000 foot level and then look at the answer choices, make a quick choice and move on and just acknowledge that you might have gotten that question wrong. It's what I call the rule against perpetuities rule. When I see an MBE question on the rule against perpetuities, I just zip right back down, find a letter and move on. And I give it 15 or 20 seconds because the odds of getting it right are so low. And so I guess that's really my, my point about that. I, you want to about no, that? I completely agree. I think if you're diagramming, I mean, this person said property, Civ Pro, and some contracts questions. If you're diagramming property, Civ Pro, and contracts, you're not finishing the test in time. Like, I just don't see how you could diagram all those subjects and uh, answer all the questions in the time constraints. So, yeah, definitely. Like, I, I know that it's it, it feels weird. I think it's probably a bit more of like a you know like a like a pacifier for a toddler, right? It doesn't really need the pacifier to go to sleep, but it's just like I've always had the pacifier. So, like, you know, don't take it away from me. I won't be able to. You you'll be okay. I know it's like a security thing that just feels comfortable yeah. to have that pencil. I totally get. That that like I I like to have the pencil and the paper and it makes you feel like just comfortable if you yeah if you need it you've got it but you don't need it you don't need it so practice without it I think that's the biggest thing is you need to get comfortable for what does it feel like to not have that pencil in hand when you're going through these questions yeah um, all right can somebody provide tips on how to do an MPT on Exemplify Jackson, can someone provide tips? <laughs> well, I, I did a I did a video. It's yeah. in the online course about how to write the uh, performance test uh, online. So you should definitely be watching that. If you're taking the exam uh, Plan B, all of the Plan B jurisdictions, including California, have 90 minute performance tests. So you should be watching that. Now, obviously, that doesn't apply to Florida. They don't have a performance test, but everybody else should be looking at that. 
If you are taking the bar exam in 2021, you could look at that video right now in anticipation of performance tests online, but certainly not necessary. What we've tried to do in the video is to walk through an actual performance test to show you how we would read it, how we would work with three screens, although some jurisdictions obviously are offering scratch paper, but we wanted to show you the most restrictive. You couldn't highlight, you couldn't use scratch paper, you had to be on three screens. So we've tried to demonstrate the way that, to do that. So that's my, my recommendation. I think it's about a 45 minute video and, and that's what I would encourage you to watch. All right. Alicia asked, with results still coming out, is the pass rate still going up? Yes, it is unbelievable. We, I think I've yet to see any jurisdiction that it has dropped or even stayed the same. They are all going up. So that's really good news. Definitely. All right. And Debbie said, do you expect MBE scores to be a lot lower since the amount of questions is cut in half to the 100? I'm worried that this will be a negative for everyone. No, I don't think it will. I mean, and I think that we don't know yet because no one's done a hundred question MBE. But what's going to happen is every state in the October 5th and 6th test will use their own psychometric scale, which is they will look at how many raw questions their applicants get right. And then they will decide whether or not to simply take that number as a raw score or whether or not to add some sort of a boost based on the same general approach that the MBE used with the national conference. The challenge here is that every state is going to do this independently. There is no one scoring mechanism. The NCBE has said we will not score, nor will we equate the scores or do anything even related to that. So California might choose to, to evaluate a score, let's say, of 60 raw questions correct, might be a 60 in California. It might turn out to be a 62 or a 63 in New York because they would choose a different psychometric value for this. There's no way to know that. I'm not aware of any state as of this moment that has announced their policy, and I think they're unlikely to announce it because I don't think they want to get locked into it. My guess is what's going to happen is that the state will get their exam scores back, the, the raw scores, and they will make some determination based on what the, the, the curve, the bell curve looks like, the, where the dots go, and make a decision about whether or not they want to add to or stay with it. The goal should be, I think, 60 questions correct out of 100. That's what I would be looking for at this point. I think in any jurisdiction, 60 correct probably is going to be passing. There might be some jurisdictions where 55 or above might be okay, but there's no guarantee of that at all. There's no indication of that. So I would, I would use 60 as your goal. All right. And now if we want to talk about, we've got a lot of emails that just generally are about stress and fear about this October exam and the sort of overwhelm that people are feeling like I've been studying for so long and still haven't taken the exam. And it's going to be so different than the normal way of doing it and just feeling a lot of anxiety and fear and, you know, just kind of ready to give up. So do you want to speak to that sure. kind of more broadly? Sure. Sure. The Abundance for Bar Study 90-minute master class is very much like what we do in boot camp to give you tools, actionable tools, five specific tools to use to manage your stress when you're studying and your anxiety, and then on exam day as well. And these are really practical things that you can do. The, the master class is available, and I would encourage you to go through that. It's 90 minutes. It's available for permanent replay. There's a workbook that goes with it. And that 90 minutes, I know some of you are saying, I can't afford to take the time off of study. Yeah, you can. This 90 minutes is really worth the time, particularly if you're feeling anxiousness or stress. I think it's a huge resource to be able to deal with that. So that's my number one recommendation. That's why I build it. Uh, we did it during you know the last couple of months because we saw the stress levels building. So it is our response to that. Regarding subjects that will only be tested in Florida essays and not multiple choice, property, contracts, con law, do you see any value in continuing to do multiple choice practice questions for purposes of learning the subject matter or focus only on the essays? You know, at this point, I think if you've been studying, if you were ready to take the exam on August 16th, <laughs> whatever that day was, I would not do more multiple choice questions in those topics. I would be writing essays, I think. But I also know we've got some people in the course that did not sign up until that point in August who are just working their way through the course. And so if you're still working your way through the course, go ahead and do the directed 
25 or 30 questions in each subject, even though it's a multi-state subject because it's an efficient way to learn that material. But if you've been through the material, if you've done the, uh, the reading or photo reading and you've done the lectures and you've done 100 or 150 plus questions of multiple choice questions, no reason to keep doing them or to do more of them. I would now switch over and do essays in those topics. Okay. All right, let's stick with the MBE subject and we're gonna kind of talk about some different aspects of that. All right, I performed well on the 2014 and 2009 MBE. However, I'm a bit concerned that my results are misleading because many of the questions felt familiar since I've taken the test in the past. Should I be concerned that this isn't as strong of an indicator anymore? No, I wouldn't be concerned about that. I mean, you know, look, the worst thing that happens is you get on the bar exam and you say, wow, this looks familiar. I've seen this question before. <laughs> what I what I really want you to be doing is working from your non-conscious. I want to remind everyone that the entirety of this course is built on the idea of the human potential movement, which is that you already know the material. You just have to access it. So when you when questions look familiar to you, that's a good thing. That means you're drawing on your non-conscious, and that's what we want you to do on the bar exam itself. I think that where people get into trouble is they overthink, they overanalyze. We were talking about earlier, they diagram, they write out things, they spend too much time. And that's where performance set tends to suffer. The, the real key, if you're really feeling like, well, maybe this isn't real or not, take the questions you missed, make sure that you work those into your mind maps, look at the, the answer explanations and drill down, spend some time working photo reading or mind mapping into those subjects, or even going to the interactive videos and looking at just that part of the video again, just to get a little more detail and a little more depth. I think those are the, the good things to be doing. But I also think, and maybe you could speak to this, Megan, there's a tendency at this point to always be looking for the other shoe to drop, right? It, it's never quite good enough and yeah. something could go wrong. I think that's a mindset question. Yeah, great. All right, my MBE practice scores weren't nearly where I wanted them to be in time for October, so I decided to withdraw and continue my studies with CBR so that I felt more prepared for February. Where do you think my percentages should be for correct MBE scores to feel confident for my next exam? Well, I think right now it doesn't really matter for lots of reasons. One is it's now way too early to be worried about performance as a predictor or a measurement. Secondly, we don't know, as we've been talking about, we just don't know what the test will be. We don't know if you'll have 100 questions or 200 questions or something different. So there's no way to know what that really means. And I think the third thing is that if you are too focused on outcomes and not focused enough on process, you tend to get tunnel vision here. And so <clears throat> at this stage, if you're a February or a July 2021 bar taker, process is what you want to be looking at. Am I answering questions using the selective intuition method? And we've got lectures in the course dealing with that and talking about that. Am I doing questions in 90 seconds? Am I creating my mind maps? Am I building out my understanding of the subject? If you're doing those things, you're going to be okay. And it doesn't really matter how many questions you get right as you practice at this point. This is a similar question, but a bit more specific uh, from the chat box. I've scored 62 and 63 out of 100 on the last two MBE practice tests. Do you think a 65 would be passing in California? Well, it's what we were just talking about. I don't know. I think 60 is the first target I would look at. I mean, do you have a feeling about this, Megan, about what the, the score would be? I'm going to be honest. I don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. This is just so... It's uncharted territory. Oh, she did that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried. Look, folks, I tried to get her to, to commit, but she's not going to commit. I've tried offline, too. Yeah. I think, look, is 65 is better than 62, you know, right. but, I, but we don't know. And, and more to the point, if you ask the California bar examiners today, I don't think they know either. I don't think anyone will know until they get the aggregate scores in and they see where they fall. Yeah. And then they'll decide what they think the cut line is. And then they'll back that into deciding what to do with the essays and performance tests. And all of that will be determined by how many applicants there are and how many people the Cal Bar thinks should be admitted to the, the bar exam. Because whether we, it's the dirty little secret that we don't talk much about, but there's a quota. I mean, I, I've said for years, there is a quota. It's not an absolute ground in stone quota, but there is a number at which the bar examiners are comfortable admitting X number of people into the bar. This is why you get 26% pass rates. And, you know, if the examiners want to, you know, loosen the spigots a little bit, they can do that pretty easily. But if they don't want to do that, then they're going to say, well, 
you know, in, in our view, but to get the, the scaled score you need, it had to be good to get 70 correct out of 100. Well, who knows? I mean, California has historically had the highest multi-state score required. It would be a 72. I mean, if we were being 72 is what would translate to a 144, except that it wouldn't take 72 raw correct to get there. It would be scaled by the, the national conference. So about 66, 67 out of every 100 questions probably would be enough. But there, there's no way to predict that right now. That was deeply unsatisfying, wasn't it? I know. Sorry. I know. I mean, it's so hard because people want, I understand you want to target. You want to know, okay, if I do X, then I'm good. Um, and unfortunately, even the examiners cannot give you that number. And right anybody now. that tells you a target that says X and you're, you're golden is just, they're just lying to you. It's just nobody knows that. Uh, in going over MBE questions, Three weeks out from the Cal Bar exam, do you recommend we spend ample time on the answer explanations or continue on to the next question? I want to make sure I don't repeat the same mistakes in answering incorrectly on a question. I would do maybe uh, 10 questions in 15 minutes and then go and review answer explanations and work on mind maps and, and adding to your notes. Yeah, great. All right. Still more MBE questions. This is, I, I find that it's very interesting. When we get this close to the exam, it tends to be pretty much exclusively MBEs. So yeah. hopefully this is helpful for everyone. Okay. So do we know how many MBE questions there will be per topic on the shorter October exam? We don't specifically, although the examiners have indicated an equal percentage, most likely across the seven topics. So I guess I'd take a hundred and divide by seven. That's probably what you'll see. There has been no indication of a disproportionate weighting as there was years ago in the, the bar exam. So I think they'll stay with the equal weighting. Yeah. All right. And then are there going to be any ungraded questions on the 100 question multiple choice exam? No, there will not. This, the, because the national conference is, is struggling to come up with questions. They, I, my guess is they used every question they had in the, you know, in the, in the, in the room. Hey buddy, you got, a, you got a torch question over there. Give me a torch question. There, there are no evaluation questions because they're not evaluating any. Right. Okay. Be selling questions to the bar examiners in each jurisdiction and saying, here you go, buddy, take the questions and use them, but nothing beyond that. So all hundred are going to count. Yeah. Maureen just asked, do you know if it will be the same number of questions for each subject for Florida? Florida's a harder exam to figure <laughs> out <laughs> on many levels. My, my original assumption had been that they would take three topics and do 33 or 34 questions in each of those topics. That is their normal approach to day one of the Florida bar with multiple choice. And I still think that's a pretty high likelihood. But when they announced the topics that were going to be on the exam, they kind of inferred that it might be more topics than just the three, which would make for this weird conglomeration. But the way that their scoring is set up is to score in six silos, one for SA1, SA3, and then multiple choice topic one, multiple choice topic two, multiple choice topic three. I think because their systems are all set up for that, their grading is all set up for that, their calibration is all set up for that. Given the fact that they have to turn results out very quickly, I think they're going to stay with what they've always done, which is this six categories. And I would not be surprised if you get a six total categories, three SA, three multiple choice, and the multiple choice, it might have, for example, a Florida civil procedure question that happens to occur in a torts problem. And you might think, what's well, a torts question? Well, no, it's really a civil procedure question. It just lives in torts. I think that's more likely. So my expectation still is for three primary topics. And of those three topics, we've already discussed in our preview video what we think they'll be. So if you're a student in our course, you should watch that again. I'm standing by that. What, what I had predicted or previewed going into the uh, August exam, in my view, has not changed for this test. Yeah. All right. So we've got some questions about the essays, and some from students previously and some from the chat box. So Okay. All right. Jeff says, I've been doing a lot of essays over the last week and a half, but I'm finding that my rules don't really match to the example answers. How do I hammer in the rules without memorizing? Well, there's a couple of things here that I'll, I'll say, Megan, you probably could just weigh in on this as well. Sample answers are not model answers. Sample answers come from the bar examiners or other sources. And by virtue of copyright, we can't modify them. So a lot of times sample answers have the wrong law. 
or they have contradictory law or they have not complete law. That's the reality of sample answers. And so that's not what you should be comparing against. You should be comparing against your mind map and against the outlines. That's where you get it. You do not need memorized black letter law. What you need is a paraphrase of the law, which is what the FLA writing system is designed to do. So don't hold yourself to this standard. And this is again, when people start reaching for miracle cures, I'll just memorize everything and then it'll all work. No, it won't. If that had worked, you, would have, you wouldn't be in this course, frankly, you'd already have passed the bar exam because that's what most of you did first time around. So memorization is not the answer here. You should work to paraphrase. That's my take. Will you, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think also it's, you know, how do I hammer in the rules without memorizing? You don't hammer. I mean, I think that's it, right? And that's what memorization is, is it's hammering. It's this forcing, yeah. you know, and then and then when you get to an essay, the strategy, if you've memorized, then when you get to an essay, the strategy is you issue spot and you pull those rules kicking and screaming out of your head and they don't want to come and you just force them out of there and I will make it work. And that is not the most effective way. It just doesn't work for most people, you know, as evidenced by the insane low pass rates that we see in so many jurisdictions. So what it is, is that you've got to completely change your mindset about understanding the rules. We want you to understand them. That means that you see how they work in context. That's through your mind maps, through doing essay work and thinking about it, right? So it's that being a lawyer, what you're trying to show on the bar exam is you know how to think about the rules, not that you know how to spit up rules that you have memorized, okay? So it's just a completely different way of thinking about it. And I get that that's super complicated and difficult and it's really hard to relearn an entire you know sort of mindset system but it really works if you can find yourself you know find the path to having an internalized understanding of the law as opposed to a memorized version of the law which is really only helpful for spitting out oh, there's an issue, here's the rule, here's an issue, here's the rule, here's an issue, here's the rule. Look at Georgia, they're doing this open book. You know, look at Indiana, they did the open book. That's useless, right? It's useless to those students. And the point, the reason why they could do open book is because those jurisdictions actually, and all the jurisdictions, I will argue very forcefully, do not actually care about, did you get the right law? They care about seeing your reasoning about the law. So that's you bringing in yourself, your common sense, Anyway, sorry, I could go on and on. If you do conferences with me, you're like, oh, I've heard her talk about this ad nauseum. You know, this is what I talk about with my students is like what that process looks like. Yeah, and this is the basic, it's the foundational principle of our course. It has been for 25 years. So yeah, yeah. definitely agree. But it's complicated, I know. Um, okay, uh, Wenda says, I get stuck when writing essays and find that I'm not covering all the points. Any suggestions? Well, start by getting the call of the question on the paper right away so that you've got all of the uh, calls there and then ask yourself what's in dispute for each of those. I don't know what all the points means. That's usually a, a pseudonym for issue spotting. Right. And issue spotting. I know people don't want to say issue spotting because they afraid I'll jump down. <laughs> but that's really what they're talking about. You don't need all the points and you don't need all the issues. All you need are the disputes. The disputes are the bullseye on the target. If you'll write about what's in dispute, you'll get all the points you need. There is no value to write about things that are not in dispute. You don't need to discuss or discuss all the elements of a contract if the only thing that's missing is consideration. And I think it's, you know, we're, we go back to first principles. Mm -hmm. uh, we get close like this and then we extend it out. We ask people to study for this long period of time. And so then they start scrambling around thinking maybe there's something extra they need to do or look for. But, you know, if you go back to the original lectures you went through in essay writing and the essay writing webinar and the thought reversal videos I made about answering essays and multiple choice questions, nothing's really changed. Mm -hmm. And so that should be what you continue to do. That's what works. That's what we stake our reputation on. It's what we know will work for you. And I think the great danger is that you stray away from that in an effort to find the shiny new object uh, at the last minute. All right. What's the best way to practice essays online? I've been practicing in Word. Well, I, I don't think I'd use Word. I think I would use a text editor or something that, that doesn't autocorrect. Although some of these, I guess, exam soft in some states will spell check. I saw in Florida spell check. Spell check. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's just doing them online, doing them under time conditions, putting the question online so you're not looking at a book as you answer it. 
but looking at the actual online version of the question. Again, we've got a video in every course about how to write essays online. It's a 30 minute video and you ought to watch that. Yeah. All right. We're almost done. <laughs> Jonathan asks, preparing for the February 2021 exam, do you believe that DC or Maryland will offer an in-person UBE instead of a remote exam? I don't know. I mean, I, I think it, it really depends on what where we are with COVID and and then where, where it goes from there. I would assume, I would prepare as though it's going to be an online exam. And then we'll find out if, if we're going to be able to do them in person. But. Yeah, I think it's easier to make the switch for yourself mentally from prepping for online to it not being online than it is to prep for an in-person exam and then make the switch mentally to online. So probably so. like prep for the online. And then if you are going to do it in person, great. I don't think you're going to be like thrown off by that. It's a, yeah, in general, people are more comfortable moving that direction. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then our last question from the chat, chat box is, um, I'm a bit behind. I have 20 assignments before I hit the end of the substantive portion of the syllabus. I'm assuming this is an October student. I've been doing about five a day and doing long days to finish. What should I focus on and what do you suggest for me in California? Well, in California, mm -hmm. it's hard to say. I, I think following the study guide, if you're a photo reader, photo read, follow that assignment use the you could use the interactive videos in the subjects to get to the, the parts of the video lecture that you think are most important for you maybe you don't need to watch an entire lecture it's the same lecture it's just broken up into chunks so i would look at the bar map page i think that you know you've got to make sure you write an assigned essay or two in every subject you've got to get a performance test or two in between now and the exam and you want to be getting through all the subjects so you can do one or two of the opes there's no shortcut here. I don't think there's a way to cut things off. California is not an exam that you can take lightly. So, you know, this is a situation I think sometimes where people through no fault of their own just end up backed into a corner. You do the best you can. And then I think you have to make a decision about, you know, soon about whether or not you're going to sit for the exam on October 5th and 6th, or if you just wave off right now and try and get into the February 2021 exam. Because if you go in badly prepared in October with a high probability of failure, you are not going to be able to take a February 21 exam. I mean, it may get pushed back to March or April or something, but I think it's pretty clear in California, there's not going to be that turnaround time as we were talking about earlier. So I think you have to make a, a really clear decision about what you're going to do. And frankly, for some people, that might mean saying to your employer, I need more time off or you, I need help with the family or you know, childcare or, or just acknowledging you're just not going to be ready. And then don't blame yourself. I mean, it's just, it's just the reality of the circumstance. And if you're not ready, you're not ready, but please don't go into the exam half ready and think that somehow a miracle is going to happen. It's certainly not in California. And I, this is, you've been saying for some time, Megan, you thought of those 12,000 registrants in California, we would see a huge drop off in terms of the actual numbers. I think that's absolutely the case uh, for lots of lots of reasons. These are great questions and, and we're yeah. really trying hard to be responsive. I hope this is helpful to you. We'll be back next Wednesday. There'll be a few of you in exams, obviously at that point. So good luck to those of you who are now a week away from your exams. We'll be uh, sort of getting into our last uh, push then for the October 5th and 6th tests. We may know something more in some of those jurisdictions and we may know something in Florida, although I don't necessarily expect a whole lot of them in this fallback plan. So we'll keep you informed there. I hope everybody has a good study week. Uh, please, again, our message is try not to be distracted. Try not to let the noise get into your head. Just keep working, doing the things you've got to do. You're almost there. I know it feels like it's just forever. It feels that way to us. Uh, so I know it must feel that way to you. Yeah, everybody's working so hard. So, you know, keep yeah. it up. Hang in there. Two weeks. It's, it's it's coming. It's coming. Well, sorry, three for Florida. <laughs> of course. Yeah, so there you go. All right, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you, Megan. We will talk to you all next Wednesday and stay safe and healthy. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks for listening and watching the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers at celebrationbarreview.com. 